a new era. The point at which this occurred is obviously up for debate. The rapid growth of the internet and the recent explosion of technology based on social networking have changed the game forever. There's no way to roll it back. I was speaking to one of the young people here and um, asking her how does she hook up with, with people who have you know, like kinds of, of interests. She said, oh, Facebook. I said, well, how many of your friends are on Facebook? She looked at me with that look. She said, everybody. Oh, everybody. So everybody's on Facebook. Rethinking human capital development in light of the demands of the new era is essential. And I firmly believe that human capital is the new coin of the realm. It is now the primordial and most important asset on our planet. It's more important than natural resources, including oil, financial resources, and geopolitical influence. In 50 years, the wealth of nations and regions will be measured by the value of their human capital. As a result, it's finally time to make human capital growth our top priority. We've talked about it for years, but we've done very little. It's now time to turn, turn talk into action, and it's no longer an option. So how do we fall so far behind on this issue of growing human capital? I've pondered this question for years. It looks to me, in many cases, like it can be solved, yet we continue to wrestle with the same issues year after year. Um, I've spent some years out of the business, relaxing in semi-retirement, and when I return, it feels like we've regressed 10 years. So we're not moving forward. I've arrived at the conclusion that we have long misunderstood the role that high-quality talent plays in the success of any enterprise. Nations have put enormous effort into building incredible infrastructures for fi financial and monetary systems, transportation, communications, national defense, foreign affairs, and other essential national priorities. List of systems that have been mastered as long. What has not been mastered is human capital development. Human capital has never been elevated to the status of the other infrastructure systems. It has not received the high levels of focus, investment, and overall mind share that is devoted to other national priorities. As a result, failure to grow scalable and sustainable human capital structures, infrastructures, has become the single greatest impediment to growth and in some cases, survival. And by the way, um, in my opinion, this applies to regions, nations, businesses, and the enterprise. Allow me to offer an illustration. If a nation decides to build a state-of-the-art transportation system, the path's fairly straightforward. You bring in the experts to develop a transportation plan that supports the long-term economic development plan. The science and the know-how are abundant. The capabilities in transportation have been perfected over the course of decades. Then they make the decision to invest the financial resources necessary to get the job done and hire a general contractor to build the system under the government's supervision. The project is managed by a very specific, or to a very specific and measurable conclusion. It's either there or it isn't. It's either good or it's not. And there are a number of companies around the globe who can make this happen. It takes a few phone calls, and they're well on their way. On the other hand, if that same nation wishes to build a state-of-the-art human capital development system, I can think of no team of experts and no general contractor who can make that happen. There is no number to call. The truth is that there is no state-of-the-art human capital development system. It remains to be invented. The business of human capital development in this 21st century environment is a new and daunting frontier. Nations that are able to conquer this frontier will be well positioned for anything that they may face in the coming decades. It is time to reinvent how we learn and work. It is also time to dissect our human capital structures and closely examine them in light of this new era into which we find ourselves. 
Then we can reassemble them in a way that makes sense and sets the stage for success in the 21st century. And at the risk of alienating our educators in the audience, it's time to take a close look at redesigning education. And this will not be popular. I suggest starting with a blank sheet of paper. Trying to re-engineer the existing systems is unlikely to create breakthrough solutions. Um, I can tell you that, um, excuse me, I had the opportunity to speak with one of the um, state superintendents of education for one of the largest states in America. I asked him one simple question. I said, what is the purpose of education? Why do we do it? Why do we spend these hundreds of billions of dollars, this time, this national effort, this state resource effort? He spent about five minutes trying to explain it to me. I was more confused at the end than I was at the beginning. In short, he didn't have a clue. And he runs one of the biggest education systems on the planet. Second, throw away catch-up thinking and embrace breakout thinking. In 2000, I joined Apple as their chief talent officer. A few months before I joined them, their stock was trading between $65 and $70 per share. And the company was considered very successful. And I had been working with them as a consultant for a while. Um, I was very excited. I was looking for this spectacular long-term growth, $70 a share. You know, why not $150 a share? So I told Steve Jobs, you know, who many of you are familiar with, I said, I want to shut my business down. I want to relax a little bit. I want to take my, wi I want to take my wife to Bali. And then I'm going to come in, and we're going to have the fight. We're going to build this company to meteoric size. At, the point we had, at that point, we had 3,000 jobs open that we couldn't fill. The day I arrived, the stock was trading at $4.50 per share. The tech crunch had happened. The Internet bubble had burst. And the PC market had been, de had been decimated. We were projecting our sales to drop by as much as 70%. Can you imagine 70% what that does. So we had to sit down, and I, and I still remember this vividly. You know, you think that these great minds, and you know, many of you who run large institutions know this, that they have these great insights automatically. Something catastrophic happens, they've got the answer. Well, I can tell you that there were three of us sitting in a room, uh, right after I arrived, Steve Jobs, myself, and our, and our chief financial officer. And we had no clue what to do. And as far as we could see through our headlights, our corporate headlights, we saw no way out. So we had to make some decisions. And by the way, we were up against some very, very tough competitors. We were the smallest most minuscule players in the entire system. Microsoft, Dell, Sony, Hewlett-Packard, Compaq, I could continue on forever. We were infinitesimally small, and therefore we were the most vulnerable of all. We had to make a quick series of decisions that would determine our fate forever. There were two core questions. Do we take a conservative path and cut costs? That's what all the analysts wanted us to do. That's what everybody else was doing. Or do we move forward aggressively and continue to build exciting new products and services? Obviously, we chose to move forward. 